the number of stars in the Milky Way is very difficult to determine. But, based on detailed analysis of star distances, star motions, hydrogen radiation from spiral arms, galaxy rotation curves, and mass, including dark matter, astronomers currently believe that the galaxy has a relatively flat rotating disk, 100 to 120,000 light years wide and 1,000 light years deep, with some 100 to 400 billion stars. This image, out of the Spitzer Science Center and the University of Wisconsin, represents an attempt to synthesize over a half century of work on the galactic disk structure, based on data obtained from the literature at radio, infrared, and visible light wavelengths. The galactic center itself, with the supermassive black hole that we discussed earlier, is shaped like a bar. Although most parts of the Milky Way galaxy are relatively uncrowded, roughly 10 million stars are known to orbit within just a single light year in the galactic center, in a region known as the Central Bulge. Recent surveys discovered the two 3 kiloparsec arms, named for their length. They are now generally thought to be associated with gas flow roughly parallel to the central bar. Using infrared images from Spitzer, scientists have discovered that the Milky Way's elegant spiral structure is dominated by just two arms wrapping off the ends of the central bar. One is named Scutum Centaurus and the other is named Perseus. Each of these major arms consists of billions of young and old stars. Three thinner arms spiral out between the two giant arms. These are called Sagittarius, Norma, and the outer arm. These are primarily filled with gas and pockets of star-forming activity. There is also a spur off the Sagittarius arm, called the Orion Spur. It's 3,500 light years across and approximately 10,000 light years long. We are located on the inner edge, halfway along this spur, around 26,000 light years from the galactic center. When we fill the space between the arms, we get the full picture. It's interesting to note that the number of stars per unit volume of space in the region between arms is the same as the number in the arms themselves. What distinguishes the arms is that they have a far greater number of younger stars. In fact, all the known H2 star-forming regions in the galaxy exist inside the arms. We don't see any in the area between the arms. If we lay a grid over the galaxy, we can locate some of the stars, nebula, and H2 regions we have seen in this chapter. Actually, all the local neighborhood stars would fit into the red circle I used to locate our solar system. That would be stars like Wolf 359, Altair, Vega, Polaris, Capella, Aldebaran, the Pleiades, and Betelgeuse. They are all with us in the Orion Spur, as is the Orion, Horsehead, Cone, Witch's Head, Veil, and many other nebula. In Sagittarius, we see the Jewel Box Star Cluster, and the Trifid, Omega, Lagoon, Eagle, and Cat's Paw Nebulas, among others. In Perseus, we see the Rosetta, Heart and Soul Nebulas, as well as the Crab Supernova, to name just a few. In fact, except for the hypervelocity stars and a few of the supernova remnants, everything we have seen in this chapter is within this red circle. As vast an area as we have covered, it is only a fraction of the Milky Way galaxy. Another point that ought to be covered is that we cannot see through the galactic core into the other side. The core is simply too dense, with stars and gas and dust to penetrate, so this slice of the disk has not been seen or analyzed. But our understanding of spiral galaxies is that they are symmetric, so this picture makes that assumption and fills in the blanks accordingly. Here we see the Sun's orbit around the galactic center. Our orbital speed is approximately 230 kilometers per second or 143 miles per second. That's fast, but it takes us around 213 million years to complete one orbit around the galactic center. The last time we were in the same place in our orbit, dinosaurs were just starting to appear on the Earth, and we have traveled around one ten thousandths of a revolution since the origin of humans. Here's a look at our solar system's ecliptic plane with respect to the galactic plane. It's just over 60 degrees off we see that the solar system is quite out of alignment with the galaxy's disk. Earth's 23 degree tilt to the solar plane puts us at an almost 63 degree tilt from the galactic plane. This is why the Milky Way appears at such a strange angle across the night sky. Also, as the Sun orbits the galaxy, it oscillates up and down relative to the plane of the galaxy. It does this approximately 2.7 times each time around. Astronomers estimate that we are currently at around 75 to 100 light years above the galactic plane and moving down. This estimate has us crossing the plane again in approximately 30 million years. Before we leave the galaxy's dusty disk, we'll take a closer look at the dust itself. It's critically important for calculating intrinsic star luminosity, and it's the only galaxy content that we can see to accurately calculate the galaxy's rotation curve. That's star velocities as a function of how far from the center of the galaxy they are. The Milky Way's rotation curve 
is one of the reasons scientists have proposed the existence of dark matter. The dust is made of thin, highly flattened flakes of graphite and silicate, that's carbon and rock-like minerals, coated with water ice. Each dust flake is roughly the size of the wavelength of blue light, or smaller. The dust is probably formed in the cool outer layers of red giant stars and dispersed in the red giant winds and planetary nebula. The dust absorbs and scatters the light that passes through it. The further the light has to travel, the more of this dust it encounters, and the dimmer it gets. Astronomers call this extinction. Due to this extinction effect, stars in the galactic disk can lose up to half their luminosity every 3,000 light years. Only the brightest stars can be seen more than 10,000 light years away. These clouds are best viewed using radio astronomy. This is because gas clouds radiate radio waves, and radio waves pass through dust particles untouched because their wavelength is much larger than the size of these particles. What's more, the hydrogen in these regions emit a spectral line in the radio frequency band, and this spectral line exhibits Doppler shifts, enabling us to measure the cloud's radio velocity relative to us. In this line of sight reading, we see a number of peaks. Each one represents a cloud. Peaks have different frequencies because the clouds have different radio velocities. The maximum peak is from a cloud that's radio velocity is close to its total orbital velocity. The best way to map out the rotation curve for the galaxy's disk is to measure the orbital velocities and distances of gas clouds and star-forming regions across the galaxy. These are the H1, H2, and molecular clouds we covered in our segment on Star Birth Nebula. These are the best objects to analyze for three reasons. One, they trace out the spiral arms. Two, we can see them clearly at great distances using radio astronomy. And three, there is a good way to calculate their distance for the inner part of the galaxy. So, for clouds closer to the center than we are, we can scan the sky bit by bit and create a map of the rotation velocity and distance for the inner galaxy. This map can then be used to find distances to all the clouds and the stars they contain as long as they are closer to the center of the galaxy than we are. For clouds further out, there are no tangent points. For these, we have to use weaker methods for determining distance and rotational velocity. We then do a best fit line for the collected data. Here's a graphic superimposed on our galactic curve that indicates the accuracy of methods used to provide the included data points. The vertical lines through each point represent the range of possible velocities for any given distance. Notice that these lines are quite long. Rotation curves give us a measure of a system's mass. And at the outer edge of the disk, the star mass density drops off dramatically. That's why, in the 1970s, everyone expected to see a rotation curve that looked like this. But what we found is that where the velocities were expected to fall off, they remained relatively constant. If our current theory of gravity holds up for galactic distances, then this curve tells us that our model of the Milky Way is missing something. In order for objects far from the center of the galaxy to be moving faster than predicted, there must be significant additional mass far from the galactic center exerting gravitational pulls on those stars. Not knowing what it is, we call it dark matter, and it extends way into the galaxy's halo. At the turn of the 20th century, astronomer Harlow Shapley, studying a large number of RR Lyra stars inside globular clusters, found that the center of the galaxy was far from the Sun. He mapped 93 globular clusters. They formed a spheroidal shape with their own center, not near the Sun. He concluded that these giant clusters formed the bony frame of the galaxy. This area around the disk is called the galactic halo, or corona. It holds a large number of old stars and 158 globular clusters. The galactic halo itself has a diameter of at least 600,000 light years based on the location of the globular clusters, although it may extend much further. In 2007, using 20,000 stars observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, an international team of astronomers discovered that the Milky Way halo is a mix of two distinct components rotating in opposite directions, the outer halo and the inner halo. Then, in 2018, a team of astronomers analyzed 7 million stars from the Gaia mission and found that 30,000 of them were moving counter to the normal Milky Way flow. Star motions and composition profiles indicated that they came from a different galaxy. They call this new galaxy Gaia Enceladus. Using computer models for galaxy collisions, they estimated that it collided with the Milky Way around 10 billion years ago. This is a computer simulation of the merger. Here we see the Gaia Enceladus is now our galaxy's inner halo. On September 24, 2012, Chandra, 
found evidence that the Milky Way galaxy is embedded with a large amount of hot gas in the halo. Counting this vast amount of gas, the mass of the halo is estimated to equal the mass of the stars in the galaxy. But as massive as it is, the amount of matter in this hot gas is not nearly enough to explain the galaxy's rotation curve. Dark matter, or a new theory of gravity, is still needed. In 2018, using both Hubble and Gaia data on globular clusters, sizes, and velocities, the mass of our galaxy was estimated to be at least 1.5 trillion times the mass of our Sun. This is more than previous estimates and indicates that the Milky Way is among the universe's larger galaxies. Let's take a closer look at how an image like this is created. From orbit, we point the camera at the center of the galaxy and then turn it 180 degrees to face away from the center. We're now looking through the plane of the galaxy, away from the center. Then we scan the camera clockwise, taking hundreds of pictures along the way. We continue the rotation through the center and all the way back to the starting point. Note that the stars on the right edge of the image, taken at the end of the rotation, are adjacent to the stars on the left edge of the image, taken at the beginning. In other words, the entire right side of the image borders on the left. Now we rotate the camera up a bit and repeat the process. We do this over and over until the entire northern sky is covered. The last shot is taken with the camera pointing straight up, perpendicular to the galactic plane. We then repeat the process for the southern sky, and we have the entire picture. Once we have all the pictures covering the spherical surface of the sky all around us, we map it to a flat surface. There are a number of ways to do this. Astronomers use the elliptical projection method because it maintains the relative size and distance between celestial objects. You may have seen maps of the Earth that use this technique. We started with an image of the Milky Way constructed within the galaxy. Whenever you see any picture of the whole Milky Way from outside the galaxy, remember that it is an artist's drawing. The size of the galaxy is so large that the distance one must travel to see it all is way too far. Here's what I mean. If we assume that our field of view is 140 degrees, we can use trigonometry to find the distance to a point where such a picture could be taken. That point is approximately 301,000 trillion kilometers, or 187,000 trillion miles from the Sun's current location. Voyager 1 left on its journey in 1977 and is traveling at 61,000 kilometers per hour, or 38,000 miles per hour. It has already gone 21.2 billion kilometers, or 13.2 billion miles. If we aim it at the photographic point, at its current velocity, Voyager won't reach this point for another 562 million years. <laughs>